YouTube setting up live meeting. It'll pop up on your show. Yeah. Okay. Well, hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of Laughter for All podcast. I, I get it mixed up because I have a show every night called Live with Naz, and but welcome to the Laughter for All podcast. This is episode number 67. This is comedian Nazareth. And I'm excited to introduce my guest, a friend of mine, and uh, he's a very, very funny guy. We've known each other for over 20 some years, and let me introduce him officially. He's from Texas, and he is, uh, as a novice jo a jokester, Smiley uh, honed his talents as a merch managing MC for bands like Newsboys, Third Day, and Mercy Me. 20 years later, Bob is now one of the nation's most in demand and hilarious screen comedians. And I remember when I used to do festivals, he was the MC all the time and, and a job that we didn't want to do as comedians because you're at Creation or at uh, Spirit West Coast. It was like 10,000 teenagers, 12 to 15, 16 years old, and no comic wants to go before them, but Bob Smiley just makes them laugh so hard and they love him and it's just amazing to see this man at work bob welcome uh merry christmas yeah merry christmas man yeah those back in the day uh yeah a lot of comics would not do anything like uh mc festivals or do uh, any kind of youth event they were scared of kids um but i was very fortunate that i had this uh thing called uh bills that needed to be paid so <laughs> oh yeah really encouraged me to uh to to answer god's calling to go out and take every junior high lock-in at 4 a.m in the morning you know right after the shaving cream fight get up and hey waka 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 and, and really kind of <laughs> hone my craft in if you will you know i did a lot and i mean early on i did a lot of youth events where i was doing teaching the comedy uh, teaching uh, the message the whole week spending the whole week but to put them in a festival and then to have like they're waiting for the news boys and then you have a comedian go in before that yeah. that's hard and you you did it beautifully so and and outdoors like it was, you know, when I started, I did not know how to be a comedian. I was just like, it was baptism by fire. I kind of just fell into it as a career. And so I remember standing at 9 a.m. at Atlanta Fest on the stage trying to, because there were smatterings of people. It wasn't even yes. bigger, but it was in a, a field that would hold 60,000 people. <laughs> and you would see a guy way up on the hill throwing a Frisbee. And he would stop and turn and go. And you, could, you couldn't hear him laugh, but you'd, you'd see him go. Just like, like, just move his head enough that you're like, okay, he thought that was funny. Now, you know, if we had people here, it would be a great show. But yeah, it was, uh, it was grueling. But all that to say, if Atlanta Fest is still happening, I'm available to MC. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happened is you had, you played the guitar and that really helped a lot because sometimes just going up on a main, main stage like oh, that and just play talking. The guitar. Do you think I'm Tim Hawkins? You, oh, you carried the guitar. <laughs> I, I carried the amps which is how i got into the festival That's, no but yeah. didn't you use i saw you once uh i was i don't know i think it's spirit west coast but you had you had a guitar on and um so that's uh, that's. I love I the did. research you've done for this show. It's very very. I do, I do, I do. I've so. never played the guitar. I I did tour with a guy named Riley Armstrong, and uh, he played the guitar. And sometimes in the middle of the show, I would get bored, not not from my own act, but just you know, like I would I would get distracted. I guess is a better word. And so mm. a couple times, and I did this with Hawkins too. I would pick up the guitar as I was telling a story, and I'd put the guitar on like I was about to play. And then I would go, if I can get serious for a second, guys, I really wish I'd learned how to play the guitar. And then I just take it off and set it back down. And then just go back <laughs> so maybe, maybe that's the time when I saw that bit. Yeah. yeah. And that's one. Uh, uh, let me ask you this. Okay. You started 20 some years ago and we're in, at the end of 2019, the end of normal life uh, as a comedian for all of us, uh, were you where you envisioned yourself when you first started? Were you at that level? Are you beyond or less or, or it wasn't you weren't even close? Where were you? As far as my career plan? Yes. Well, I never thought I'd be a comedian in, in the first place, um, you know, for the 
you know, in case there's listeners that don't know, I did a stand up competition in college for the prize money and never thought it would be a career. It wasn't something I was pursuing and I won not even because I was good, but everybody else was terrible. And this guy saw me, he went out to Nashville to uh, start road managing bands and stuff. And he was road managing a guy named Clay Cross. And they were talking about how they wanted a comedian to entertain the crowd in between the acts and keep the show rolling and stuff. And this guy tracked me down because he had seen me do that one stand-up competition in college, which I honestly did for the money, just for the cash prize. And, you know, I, I loved comedy and, you know, I, I, I had an appreciation, but I never thought I would be able to do it. And so he called, called me up and he was like, do you want to go on tour? And I remember I, I pulled over at a Cracker Barrel payphone because he had paged me. And I was <laughs> like, everything about that sentence is so old. Like if, if young kids are watching right now, they're probably Googling like crazy, like pager, <laughs> payphone, what is all this? And I called him from a Cracker Barrel payphone and I, he was like, do you want to go on tour with us? And I was like, okay. So then a year and a half later, I am standing on the stage opening for the newsboys and in front of, you know, 7,000 people. So I did not, I never envisioned any of that. So at the end of 2019, I'm still in awe uh, that people call and ask me to come to their church and that people show up and buy tickets to come to my show. Like it, it, it still has not worn off that this, this adrenaline rush of, Wow, this is really happening. I think I think Billy Crystal actually said uh, that comedians they feel phony for a long time, and they're always afraid that the comedy police are going to come and arrest you for being a phony. And uh, I felt like that for years, but even now that I'm established and been doing stuff for forever, I still when I get on stage, I'm like, oh my goodness, it's still working. Like the people are still fooled that I'm a comedian. You know what, uh, Bob? This is. I've never heard any comedian say that. And it's true because we feel the same way. Like when, when I'm ready to go on stage and it's a big audience, I, I go, man, you know what? I know I'm good enough to do this. I know I have enough. I, I know I'm going to do great. And then the back of my hand, I hope they never find out I'm a phony. Yeah. That yeah. I'm not really funny. I'm just doing this and it worked. You're right. We have yeah. that feeling even Speaking of talking about other comedians, I want to address something because when you called <laughs> me, when you called me yesterday about what eight p.m. and was like, "Hey, uh, can you do my show tomorrow?" Um, yeah. yeah, you then you sent me a list of all the people who had been on it, and I was like, "And they oh, all got a call a day before." Well, okay, but here's what I'm wondering: I'm like, how many people has he called before he even thought of me? And the list was. I read the list. It was Shonda Pierce, then Mark Lowry. And I'm thinking, okay, Ken Davis, Jeff Allen. So I'm reading the list going, well, he wanted to have them on, you know, because they're old and who knows how much longer they have. And then I saw Brad Stein and Robert G. Lee. And I was like, okay, same still, you know, and then it said, and many more, how many more before you actually called me? We've been friends for over like 15 years, at least. Like, you know, there's something called, uh, you know, out of sight, out of mind. And when some of my fans on the live with Naz said, oh, yeah, Bob Smiley. And I go, oh, Bob Smiley. So I called. Him. That's that's okay. what it is. And I tell so, you so what. People I, suggested me. So it wasn't that. I, well, I, I, they didn't suggest you for the podcast. They were mentioning how funny you are. Or we were talking about something and said, yeah, Bob Smiley does a bit about that. And that's when I went, ah, Bob Smiley. That's what it is. Let me ask you this. This is left field. So, so uh, what, but it wasn't that you thought Bob was like bottom of barrel, like the very last. No, 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 no. There's still a lot more people I'm going to call. There's a lot of people <laughs> that actually working uh, on New Year's Eve that we're not. But <laughs> I'm going to call them. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But no, no, it's not that. It just, and I'm like, uh, I'm ADD kind of sometimes. So sometimes I plan the sometimes. podcast the day before or two days mm-hmm. before. And I would call uh, the person and say, hey, can you do it? And it's always last minute, but hey, it works. This is how we work. Let me ask you this. One time a few years ago, we were talking and I think, oh, it was, uh, there was uh, like, I think it was 2008, 2009 when the economy crashed. Hmm. And I was calling you and said, how you doing, Bob, how financially? I always like to check on comics. How you doing financially? Do you need any help or anything? And you told me that you were, you're very smart and frugal, frugal with, hmm. with uh, yourself. Uh, so one guy sent me this question, Chris Rossetti, you probably know him. Oh, I know Chris. He's a great dude. 
I should have never mentioned his name, but he said, uh, uh, please ask Bob if he still collects ketchup packets from restaurant and has the pandemic forced him to buy shampoo and soap since he's not staying in hotels like he used to. <laughs> okay, that is, there's so much I wanna say about that question. That's a great question. I, when I first started and I, I started with Clay Cross and then I was uh, on tour with the Newsboys for about a year mm. and I was a starving single you know, comic out there not making hardly any money. And so I survived by going in the green room when the newsboys would get on the tour bus and just cleaning out the green room with all the food, uh, condiments. And then I'd go back to my little apartment in Nashville. And so I had ketchup packages and had all that stuff and I never had to buy all that. And I've always gotten the shampoo and the toilet paper out of the hotels because we pay for it. So, um, but it's, it's always, my wife and I have had strong disagreements about whether that's ethical and stuff like that. But when this pandemic hit, I got an extra hug because we had a room full of toilet paper. We had toiletries, we had cleaning stuff. Like it was uh, the cleanest supp supplies I probably shouldn't have taken from the hotel because I did have to get into the janitor's uh, room. But the point is, <laughs> you'll edit this, right? Um, the point is, I, I did provide for my family. But Chris brings up a great point. So this uh, so everything shut down in March. That's actually when uh, I started growing this beard coming on. Oh, I can't it. see it. Yeah, what? You need a better computer. Um, it's really thick. Uh, but we, uh, yeah, we started running out of toilet paper and stuff about June and I had to go buy it. And of course it was hard to find and, you right. know, you had to go to a gas station bathroom with, you know, screwdriver and to be able to get it. <laughs> I, you know, I have relatives who complain about this because they own service stations, Middle Eastern people, and they're like, oh, these guys are still taking. But but uh, let me see. What advice do you have for people, like a legitimate saving advice that people can save money now because everybody in this pandemic are, you know, their income is less. Do you do, you do something you feel that this is this is a great way to save money? And one thing I do is this is going to be a serious answer because uh, I am very frugal. I'm very, you know, financial because let's, let's submit it now as we're, we're in a, an uncertain career as it is Take right. away the pandemic and all that stuff. We never know when our next paycheck's coming in, uh, come right. to find out it's going to be probably 2022. So I guess we do know um, that's when my next show is. Um, what were we talking about before I started crying? <laughs> <laughs> Before you started crying, but I don't want to bring it back up so you don't cry more. What legitimate uh, advice or not a trick, but a little, uh, uh, what do you call it, thing that you do saving money that would help people? Oh, do we really need it? We see things all the time and the world is competing for our attention and our money. And the, the world is, you know, like we are, we are nothing but consumers. And so mm -hmm. everybody's trying to get you to consume their product, you know, um, whether it's, you know, stuff that you go in the grocery store and there's end caps to make you think, oh, I, I could use that. I could. And I think people will $10 or $20 themselves into bankruptcy because they're just buying a little, oh, it's no big deal. I'll just throw that in the basket. That. Well, that adds up so quickly. You know, if you actually look at your budget and see what all did you spend money on, you know, there's things that you obviously have to spend money on, you know, food, uh, stuff at bobsmiley.com, you know, right. uh, you know, you want to tithe and, you know, all that kind of stuff should have mentioned tithe before my website. I feel bad now. I um, would still, no, I would biblically, I would go with your website first. You are. A that's more man. than they need to spend more than 10%. So I would go with that first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they, actually you'll appreciate this because we go to place or we used to go to places where there would used be a to. merch fee where yes. you sell your merch, but they took a percentage of your- Yeah, for the and venue. I remember talking to a theater one time and I was trying to negotiate and they wanted 25%. And I told the guy, I said, God only takes 10%. How can you take 25%? And he wasn't a Christian. And he was like, God doesn't own this theater. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. Yeah. yeah so, that's but no, I, I think it comes down to you know, what do we really need in life? Mm -hmm. You know, what do we, what do we really need? You know, I say that as my desk is, is full of stuff that, you know, I probably, I probably didn't need Batman duct tape, like regular duct tape probably would have, you know, been as good. I don't like, I got a puzzle. 
I got a puzzle that I'm making. Are you into Batman? I'm a little into Batman. How little? Um, <laughs> quite a bit. Quite a bit. This man is telling us you don't need a lot of things, but you need I got a lot of Batman. Things, this. But I got, I, but you need Batman puzzle and Batman duct tape. I have MacGyver duct tape puzzle, that works better. Yeah, the Batman puzzle was a dollar fifty, but even that was a thing of like, do I really do I need this? Yes, I do. It's I'm going to be doing Christmas with my in laws, you know, my family. Everybody's going to be together, so I probably need a puzzle to uh, to go Keep them quiet. sneak away for and stuff. But no, I, in all seriousness, though, I, I do think we are in the uh, me generation where we think we deserve everything. And so we just mm. see it and we're like, boom, boom, boom. And debt is a big deal. I've always been very anti-debt and, you know, just just what what is our basic needs? And then if there's stuff left over, you know, we can, you know, use it. it ultimately, as Christians, we want to use that that leftover stuff to help other people but, you know, also, you know, maybe we do, maybe we do want wasabi peas instead of just regular peas, you know. Oh, they make those. Oh, oh they're so good. I know. So I need good. to get them. But I, now some, that I, yeah, somebody I sent those them. to me. So I didn't, oh. I didn't actually pay for those. And what do you have on your, on your mug? What is that? What is that? Is that Batman? Oh, it's Gonzo. I'm, I'm a Gonzo. big Muppet. If the Muppets ever make a Batman movie, I am. You're in. I am You're camping done. out. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, let me ask you this. If you were not a comedian, what else would you do? What else would you have been doing? I'm pretty good at mowing lawns. Um, <laughs> I, I know that's a joke. I mean, it sounds like a joke, but it's not. My brother and I mowed lawns like our my whole high school career. And at one point we were mowing like 34 lawns and we had a cemetery. We had, uh, you know, the community center. And it was great. We would get up and we would mow lawns all day long. We made lots of money. We were outdoors. We were in control of our own, you know, time limit. The harder we worked, the more we were rewarded. And I think that was great. <laughs> it, it's, it sounds like a bit, and I have done this bit, uh, but it's all true. We called it Smiley Brothers Mowing Company. And our motto was, we give you mower for your money. And... <laughs> And we, we put a little like sign up and we had, I, I grew up in a very, very small town. So we only had one store. And so we'd put a little ad up, you know, that said, we give you mower for your money. And every like widow that had a little farmhouse loved us. And so we would go and I'd sit on the porch and negotiate the price. And then we would mow and help clean up around the house and, you know, all that kind of, you know, extra stuff. And it was great. I loved it. So I, I'm good at mowing. During the pandemic, when all of my shows canceled, I got really into a video game called Uber Eats driving and oh. I, yeah, it's phenomenal. Like it, you get a destination on your phone, you get in the car, it's like Grand Theft Auto, you get to the, you know, you get the, the food and then you go and try to deliver it. A lot of it is in apartment complexes. So you're going up and down stairs. It's like Donkey Kong. And, um, you know, if it's in a rural area, it's more like Red Dead Redemption than uh, Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> yes, but, I played you know, both. Yes, yes, yes. But <laughs> Um, no, I don't know. I, I got, I mean, I've been Uber Eats driving anything to, you know, bring money in that I can, right. I'm still doing a bunch of stuff related to comedy. And I do have a couple of shows, um, coming up. I already mentioned 2022, so I don't think you need to promote that. <laughs> early. Uh, how do you, as a comedian, you know, you get shows and then they cancel. I'm not talking pandemic. How do you deal with disappointments? I know whenever we get a big show, we, our hopes get up and we get excited and we go, oh, this is going to open doors for this and all that. Yeah. How do you deal with disappointments? Well, I've been doing this long enough to know that not it, it, no one show is ever going to make us. You know, I used to get so nervous the first like two years that I started comedy. If I had a radio interview, you know, and I would have to get up at like, you know, four in the four morning, in the morning. Yeah. yeah. And I'd, I'd be sitting there, you know, next to my landline and I'd be practicing my bits and, and be like, okay, I got to be energetic. I thinking that this one radio interview was going to catapult. I was going to be flooded, you know, sit back and, and watch, you know, my, my space fill up with fans and all this kind of stuff. And I, through just years of doing that, I realized like no one interview especially not this one, uh, no show is going to make or break your career. So when, when shows do cancel, and I've been very fortunate, I haven't, I've only had two shows that I couldn't make 
because of flights or you know travel stuff. Mm. I've only two shows that I had to call and cancel because of that. Uh, never had to cancel because of illness. Uh, and only a couple of shows before the pandemic has actually canceled uh, because of something out of my control uh, beforehand. But when the quarantine hit, I had a show with Bob Goff, who is oh, my yeah. wife and I, my wife and I's favorite author. Uh, we actually did get to go meet him one time and kind of hang out a little bit. But this was going to be a big, huge show. And I was going to get to like hang out pretty much all day with Bob Goff. And then it was right at the end of March, maybe beginning of April and that one canceled and that one hurt just because I was like man and I'd done so much prep work I'd made videos promoting this this big thing and all that kind of stuff so that that one kind of hurt just from a selfish standpoint of I just want to hang out with Bob Goff you know Um, (laughs) yeah I did a show with I did actually a retreat with him in Arizona we spent three days but hardly saw him (laughs) just took he goes back to his room but uh (laughs) yeah it's it's hard so um what do you call it um when you were doing comedy and you were on the road and uh, and then you you and uh, well let me tell you something about what you just shared earlier about n- there's not one show that will make or break your career many many years ago uh, myself Brad Stein and Jeff Allen did a show called Life Today with uh, Robinson mm-hmm. uh, J- yeah James Robinson and I, every week they played one one of the comedians and they played uh, Brad Stein. And then I called Brad Stein. And if Brad is watching or listening, I, I mean, I'm sharing it openly and I'll share it with him. Uh, he called him. I said, how was it? He goes, man, the phone did not stop ringing. It was great. Hundreds of calls. It's going to be great. And the next week, it was my show. And man, I got up at four in the morning. I told everybody in the house, do not do anything. Do not touch the phone. I was just sitting ready for the calls. And I go, guys, get a piece of paper and pad because when it, when it rings, I'm going to take the number and we're going to talk and we're going to book and you could the calendar. Here's the calendar. Just when I ask you about a date, you tell me. Hmm. No one called. Yeah. No one called. And many years later, of course, Brad is like a mentor. I love Brad. We spend a lot of time together. Love him. And I said, Brad, do you remember? And he goes, no, not many calls. I was like, <laughs> ah. I, was like I feel better now. Because I thought, like, why wouldn't they call him? I mean, if they call hundreds of so many calls for Brad and for the other, why wouldn't they call me? And it's right. You cannot depend on one show. Yeah, uh, and a lot of that is like, timing if they all you know if there was a bunch of people looking to book events and they turned it on and they see brad and they they book those events well then next week maybe there's not that big a deal i don't know jeff allen had his dry bar comedy special came out before yeah. months, like six uh, months four months and of course his exploded and like they they could not keep up with the phone calls of people well right. so mine was getting ready to come out and i was having kind of a slow year uh in 2019 and so i thought oh and i talked to jeff um he and i actually did a thing at the houston improv uh together and i was like what was it like and it was the same thing he was like i'm booked solid for the rest of the year and i was like bring it on and my dry bar came out and it got good views and great ratings and all this and i just kept just sitting there like Hello? No, I would not like to change my phone service. I got to get off. I'm about to be booked. You know, like, hello? No, no, I don't. Okay, Marriott Rewards. Thank you. You know, like it was nothing. So uh, you yeah. just never know, man. You never know. That's Actually, the same thing. This kind of goes with it, though. I think God is totally in control and can use us all in different ways. And we have to be willing to accept that. Uh, you just remind me of Brad Stein's story. So I'd been doing stand-up for about six or seven years, maybe. And I feel like I was getting, you know, good at it. And I feel like I was making a name and my show date calendar was full and it was, it was really starting to work. And then all of a sudden Brad Stein just exploded on the scene. I remember that. Yeah. And he was doing the, uh, what was the men's conference thing? Yeah. The God man. Yeah. It wasn't that it was something, um, put a helmet on. No. Oh, he did the, the put it put the helmet on uh, thing was out, but he was um, man. What was it? It doesn't matter. But there was a big men's conference where he was traveling around, and even to this day, people still come up and say, "I saw you." Oh, at- the promise keepers. Promise. Keepers. Promise. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember. I still had people come up and say, "I saw you at Promise Keepers," and I was like, <laughs> "Nope, that was I." And now I don't even correct them. I'm just like, "Yep, that was me. I was playing the guitar." 
you know, I just let them, you know, think what they, they want to think. But Brad Stein showed up at, uh, it was Cincinnati, Ohio. It was called uh, Kings Island. And uh, I was yes. in the scene, but I still was feeling like I'm an established comedian on it. Brad breezed in. He went up, he did a 35 minute set about four o'clock in the afternoon. So it was starting to fill up like that. It's the Timberwolf uh, arena holds 10,000 people. And it was, there was maybe like 7,000 people there. He just walks in, walks on stage, kills and walks off. But as he's killing, I'm just watching him thinking, well, my career is over with. Like now there's a new guy who obviously is better than me. He's been doing it longer. Mm -hmm. He knows what he's doing. And he walked off and there was a rapper that was supposed to follow him and the rapper didn't show up yet. And so the stage manager came to me and he was like, we, we don't, I'm trying not to say the rapper's name, but um, you know, I'll make up a name. Uh, T-Bone didn't show oh, yeah. up. And yeah. so <laughs> I hope T-Bone's not listening, but he didn't show up. <laughs> and, and so the stage manager said to me, like, will you go out and, and do some time? And I was like, okay. And I went out and I did like 25 minutes right after Brad killed. And the lesson I learned from that is there's enough room for everybody. Exactly. There's exactly. So, it doesn't matter. He wasn't taking laughs that I no longer could get. He was giving laughs. And then I got to go out and give more laughs. Like there was, you know, not a finite amount of laughs that could happen that night. And it was really, it, it was very educational to me at, at the time as a, as a upcoming comedian who just was feeling like he was starting to get going. I was like, Oh, okay. There's, there's plenty of room for us. That's yes. You're right. That's a great uh, lesson to comedians or newer comics. Do not worry who you follow. It doesn't matter if you, it's you, people want to see you. They want to know who you are. If you're original, you're, you're doing great. Have you ever at one point said, you know, I'm quitting comedy. That's it. I'm not, I'm not going to do it. I actually quit one night. Um, <laughs> it was kind of a cool story, but it was really bad. So I was on tour with the Supertones. Which, oh, yeah. I remember which, them. Yeah. So I'd done Clay Cross tour. I did the Newsboys tour. And then I got uh, the Supertones picked me up. And so now I'm standing in warehouses with no chairs. And it's like 800 youth group kids. And not even youth group kids, like kids from you know, non-Christian kids, like it was a huge just, and it was a mosh pit and, you know, oh. it was like this big deal. So it was very hard to get anybody to listen to me. And so we were doing this tour and we had this show, there was a big youth conference in Dallas called Winterfest, which I've since done a lot. But at the time, I think it was like three or 4,000 uh, youth kids, like youth group kids. And we got booked. But what I didn't know was our, the manager of the Supertones booked the Supertones at Winterfest, but added me on as a, as a package deal. So mm. nobody knew me. So they didn't really want me, but they booked me because that was the tour coming in. And so I'm get there and I'm getting excited because a lot of guys that I graduated with were now youth ministers and they were at this, this thing. It was like predominantly a church of Christ, um, yeah type deal which is you know i went to church across school and church mm. across uh, church and so all of a sudden all these guys that i went to college with was going to get to see me open for the supertones well i get there and there was four hours of speakers like mm. almost back to back and then at 10 o'clock that night it just said supertones concert and i was like i i'd been on tour with them enough to know like this is not going to be good if they're all expecting the supertones and so I talked to the guys and they were like, no, we'll make it clear. We'll make it clear that like you have a set time and you're part of the tour and all that. And I was like, okay. And so we're, we're getting ready to go. Now the kids are worn out because they've sat through, you know, four speakers Speaker. and we're, we're getting ready to go on. And the guy turns to me and I was supposed to do, I think I was supposed to do either 15 or 20 minutes. And he turns to me and he goes, Hey, we're kind of running behind, which we weren't because it was like nine 55. And he was like, um, so we only need five minutes from you. And so I'm still young enough comic to be like, I don't know how to like do five minutes. Yeah. I had planned 20 minutes. How do I, you know? And so I'm, I'm trying to do it. And uh, I was like, okay, just make sure that they know I'm on tour with them. And that, you know, and he was like, yeah, no problem. And so he walks out and he goes, are you guys ready for the super tones? Ah. And everybody, all these kids, woo! And they were like, but first, ah, ah. First, we have a guy um, 
Uh, please welcome Bob. Doesn't say my full name. Doesn't say I'm a comedian. Yeah, comedian. Say, and I walk out. We may need to edit this part, but we walk out and it's just dead quiet. Like nobody wants to see me. And I can actually see some of my friends that I graduated from just looking like, oh. And yeah. one kid down front, pardon the language, but this is actually what he said. He goes, you suck. And I didn't know it. Like, I just go, yes, I do. Absolutely, I do. Um, but I now have four and a half minutes and I'm going to tell you about my grandmother and then I'll bring up the super tones and I just start slinging jokes, like just hoping. And what, nobody's yeah. listening. But every once in a while, Somebody would like, like you would hear all these, you know, people murmur and stuff. And then you'd hear people like start to laugh and then start to laugh and start. And so by the end, getting right up close to the five minutes, I actually kind of had the audience, but not enough. And then all of a sudden the super tones in the background, uh, uh, Dan started ah. to trump it up. He wasn't doing it to be mean because he's a super sweet dude, but they heard that horns. And then all of a sudden they start chanting the super tones again. And I walked off and I actually, I had to walk off stage and not, I couldn't go backstage. So I had to walk down. And one of the oh. guys I graduated with was standing over the corner and uh, he just looked at me and he goes, um, wow, so that's what you do. And I just <sighs> felt terrible. And I went into the, the back, the green room and I called my manager and I told him, I was like, I'm done. This is, it's not working out. This tour has been grueling. Nobody wants to hear me. I don't think I'm funny. And I actually, I quit, but he said, finish out the tour and then you can quit, but just go ahead and finish out the tour, which was smart because he knew that by, if he got me to get back on the bus and go out and keep doing it, I was going to have good nights and realize like, oh, okay, I'm doing good. So I hung up and, but I was done. I was like completely done. And one of my heroes growing up was a, a speaker named Jeff Walling. And oh, I know Jeff Walling. You know Jeff Walling? Oh, he man. is right now. Actually, I played table tennis with him at one of the conferences. He is right now one of the pastors at Shepherd of the Hills. In is that correct? Am I? Are we talking about the same guy? I think so. In in the valley in California. Is he? He's a speaker. Also, he like yeah, to yeah. He has a beard. Oh. Jeff Walling. Yeah. Yeah. So growing up, he was like the Church of Christ speaker, and he put out these funny videos and all this kind of stuff, and um. So I remember sitting in the green room and it was dark and I was just miserable. And I was thinking how I was never going to get on stage again, but I promised my manager I'd finish the tour. And, and all of a sudden I hear this voice and he's like, uh, Hey, you Bob Smiley. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, man, my kids really like you. And I look up and it's Jeff Walling. And I'm oh. like, what? Jeff, Jeff, Jeff. And so I ended up like sitting there and talking to him and he was so encouraging and just, you know, he was one of my heroes and you're not supposed to meet your heroes, but if Jeff Walling is your hero, meet him because he's just an amazing dude. And um, it, it really encouraged me just to, you know, get back out there and do it. So to answer your, I know you asked a simple question. I'm giving you a plot, but. No, no, that's, no, no, that's good. I wanted to hear that. But Let I quit. Qu yeah. I, you I quit, quit for a day. I quit for a day. Yeah. And that's what yeah. makes you a great comic, Bob, because you know what? And I, I kind of relate to this because my like I do stadiums and I do a festival. I do. My road wasn't just a small a comedy club where everybody is watching, listening. It's dark and it's just you talking. Mm -hmm. You always have to fight my way to get my jokes out. There's always mm -hmm. that, you know, there's people like you know 20 feet away sitting on lawn chairs that you need to make laugh so i know it's it's hard work Let i remember doing this. I, I remember doing a festival sorry to cut you off but you no just you're not you're not this is one your show favorite, I'm, I'm about the uh, the guest this is one of the, my worst but favorite memories was i was doing stand up and i want to say it was maybe 9 30 in the morning or maybe 10 o'clock at an outdoor festival and the only people there were uh people that were putting on sumo wrestling suits and wrestling <laughs> they had a little pit on the side so i literally walked to the side of the stage and i'm doing stand up for these people that are wrestling that are in these big inflatable suits and hitting it. and every once in a while they'd hit in, you know one of them and, and look up and go <laughs> good one <laughs> you know <laughs> it was yeah see we just get these impossible terrible shows but it, i think it makes us stronger Oh, yeah. The minute then the next day you go do a, a big audience that's listening to you at a church and you're just like, this is a piece of cake. 
Oh yeah, right. I did. I did a gig. So my uh, one of my roommates in college, he was a youth minister in a very affluent uh, part of town in uh, outside of Dallas, and he could not get his youth kids to get involved or get passionate about doing anything. He couldn't even get them to come up to the youth room to hang out. Their idea of a fun youth activity was to you know fly to Vail and go snow skiing or you know something big. And, and he was like, <laughs> man, I'm trying to get this community. And, you know, kids just, because they're so wealthy, it's just hard to get a hold of their heart. And so he asked me if I'd come to a show for him. And he's like, I don't know how many people are going to be there. And so my parents were living up there at the time. So I went and I visited them. I went to do the show. There were eight kids, just mm. eight kids. So I put them all on a couch. I stood in front of eight kids. I did an hour show. And then I drove all night so I could get on a plane in Houston and fly out to Spirit West Coast. So I could do a late night event and I, I'd been doing spirit West coast so much that I, I kind of did have a pretty good following. So the late night tent shows were great. Yes. Cause like, I love them. I love yes. those. Yeah. So I, I remember doing a show for eight people one night, driving all night, getting on a plane, flying out to spirit West coast. They had to roll the sides of the tent up and there was over 2000 people in there. And I did the same show for 2000 and the night before I was doing eight. So that's what comedy is like. You that's what comedy is have. all about. Yeah. Okay, before I ask you the next question, I have a question from one of my audience members on the live with Naz. She said, I have a couple of questions that I need you to ask Bob today. It's important to let him know that they are from the Vosses, you know, Becky and Pat Voss. Oh yeah, we might want to <laughs> censor those. Yeah, how old are you? <laughs> yeah, we no, you don't to have to answer. Those. Yeah. You don't. Okay. What's your middle name? I, oh, wow. So yeah. Hold on. I'm just going to take Becky off my Christmas card list <laughs> right there. Um, my age, I'm 21. Okay. And, uh, Me too. My middle name is. Oh, it froze. Sorry. Sorry, Becky. Sorry guys. Anyway, we have to get and back. That's how I got my middle name. Also. I loved it. I, I heard it, but I don't think people heard it, but that's oh, a good, that's a long middle name. Yeah, it is very many vowels. Did it freeze? My neighbor's Wi-Fi is not good. So I'm yes. sorry if that. No, cut no out. it's okay. I heard it. Okay. It's okay. So tell me, is, is Smiley is your real name? It's my real last name. Yes. Of course, you were doing lawn and putting Smiley. So that tells me that it was a real name. Okay. Well, then. Actually, one... really, really quick, Naz, because you'll appreciate this. Because I don't know. Did you get nervous when you first started doing radio interviews and stuff? Yes, I always get nervous about anything that I think is going to make my career grow. Yeah, I remember the first radio interview I ever did was for Radio U. I think it was in Columbus, Ohio, mm -hmm. but it was a big it was a big station. And the first question they asked me was, is Smiley your real last name? Well, I just started doing comedy and Smiley had been my last name forever. And so my, my first thing I ever said on radio was, yes, yeah, Smiley is my last name. Why would I change it to? Oh yeah, I guess I see. And I just sounded like a moron. Like I didn't know what I was doing, but yeah, that, it is my last name. That's a perfect name for a comedian. Now, uh, let's see. And then the, their daughter, Sarah asked me this, what do you do with the gifts from fans, such as a very large black coffee mug with a yellow smiley face on it? Oh, I actually, Oh no, I still have that. They gave me this big, huge mug that they had uh, painted smiley face on it and uh, but it is upstairs right now we are using it uh to we're, we're doing some watercolor paint stuff and mm -hmm. so we're actually using it for that because i'm no longer allowed to fill it with coffee my wife yeah. uh, made that rule so you're not drinking coffee anymore i'm still drinking coffee but out of a small mug but yeah the muppets yeah. uh another question what is it like having a wife who is funnier than you I can answer that. Did you? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I kind of feel like that's a uh, question for Hawkins. Um, next, <laughs> no, my wife is incredibly funny. She's so funny, and uh, we, you and I were talking about this off the air, but that's that's really why we started our podcast, Hook Line and Smiley. Um, we. What is it called again? It's called Hook Line and Smiley. Hook Line and Smiley. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, we we put out. 51 podcasts last year. So we took a break over Christmas because, you know, it's the holidays and I'd never want to do anything to pull people away from their families during the holidays, you know, because I would feel, I'd feel terrible if I was putting on like a, you know, 
a podcast or a live show or something during the holidays where it would take people away from their families? Like, would well, you feel terrible doing uh, that? Not knowing that the kind of shows that I give them around Christmas is their gift. <laughs> Yeah, I'm cheap too, Naz. I'm with you. I don't know what else to get other people. But no, we, uh, she is she is very quick-witted, very funny. That's kind of one of the first things that attracted me to her because she's beautiful, but she doesn't rely on that. Is that is that too mean to say? Like, No, no, no. I know what you're saying. She's gorgeous and just funny, like really funny. And so, and she's always had a real appreciation for comedy and, and stuff. So um, yeah, it's, she's, she's good. I, I think she's the second best host on our podcast. <laughs> now, uh, now this is on Google and everything, you know, there's comedy has its, uh, what do you call it? Pressure on your marriage in the first marriage. Yeah. And there, you know, and uh, you were single for a while touring, doing single events and, what was that? What was that like? You know, having because you had to raise your boys yourself. Yeah. So again, if people don't know, uh, I was married for eighteen years. Um, then we had a huge fight. Um, it's kind of my fault. I didn't like her rich boyfriend. Um, so oh. <laughs> she was she was gone. Uh, and then I was single. Yeah, and I had three boys. Had three: um, Coulter, Trent, and Xander. And um, we, yeah, I was, I was a single dad for a long time. And what was, was that like? Uh, it was kind of, it was kind of a blessing, honestly, of like, because nobody saw this coming. Nobody saw this, you know, like I, right. I should have seen signs. Like we were vacationing with these people and hanging out with them all the time. And I should have probably, you know, but you just never think it, it would happen to you kind of thing. And mm. so all of a sudden, uh, my the floor in my world my sturdy foundation floor it felt like it just all crumbled out from under me and honestly like my boys and I kind of circled the wagons and just loved on each other and uh, you know the house became very much a frat house and you know we had I didn't think it was that bad but when my wife uh, moved in uh, I've since married and uh, so when she moved in uh, I became aware that uh, my house was a little different than other houses. Not everybody has a ping pong table in the living room and a shopping cart and, you know, some other things that I thought was, was natural decor. Um, <laughs> but it was, so it, it was kind of a bittersweet thing. Me and the boys were going through uh, a lot of tragedy, dealing with a lot of trust issues and, mm. you know, just uncertainty of the future. But we also became very, very close with each other. And we, you know, you, you kind of, I think a lesson that we learn, you always hear about God's unconditional love um, about no matter what, but when, when you're really in the depths of uh, the fire, so to speak, uh, and you're relying on each other, man, you, you know, you have a lot of grace for each other. You just, you truly have unconditional love for, for each other to help each other get through whatever it is that you're going through. And so, you know, there was a lot of, it, it obviously was a really bad thing, but there was a lot of glimmer and hope. One of the things I actually talked about this on stage, but, you know, I grew up a Christian and I've read the story of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego forever. And mm. I always thought it was a cool story, you know, that God would get you through anything, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I really, I'm saying blah, 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 meaning like, that's how I read it. Like, of course, God gets you through anything, but I'd never really struggled with anything before. Like I never had any, you know, like never really dealt with a lot of tragedy or, you know, uh, betrayal or anything. And then all of a sudden, you know, my kids and I felt like we were in the fire, um, just like that. And I was reading that story one time to my kids and I just stopped because I'd never focused on the part that God saved them in the fire and not actually from the fire. And that had never resonated with me because I'd really never been in the fire. I had a great childhood, um, loved you know school, loved college, um, started this dream job that I'd never even dreamed of, but it became my dream job to do stand up and was getting a tour and you know make people laugh, tell them about Jesus, and you know it was just everything was just falling into place. Um, it just seemed like I was really having a great life, and then all of a sudden this you know it felt. Yeah, I feel like I fell in the fire. 
And it was, it's cool to look back now. I don't want to make it sound like I was this really strong Christian because there were, I made really bad decisions and, and, you know, had doubt and I let anger take over and all that. But now I can look back at it and be like, oh, God was with me here. God was with me and my boys here. You know, ironically, we're, we're doing this. I know you're going to put this podcast out later, but we're filming this live on uh, 1229. And Facebook just sent me, you know, how whenever you log on to Facebook and it says yeah. this is your memory, uh, memory. Well, five years ago, it was all just starting like, and so somebody heard that me and my boys were going through this and they had a, a snow cabin in New Mexico, uh, Cloudcroft. And so they said, Hey, you can use our snow cabin. Uh, if you want to take the boys and get them, you know, just get them away and kind of regroup and everything. And I was like, Oh, that sounds awesome. Cause my kids love water skiing, but they never snow skied and they wanted to. And so <laughs> I booked the flights and then a couple of weeks before I called this guy and I was like, you know, Hey, uh, you know, what do we need to know? And, uh, and he was telling me all the stuff to do in town. And I was like, well, we're not even going to do that. We're just going to ski. And he goes, Oh, they haven't had snow in five years. <laughs> and I was like, Ooh. Ooh. well, that would have been good to know. And so I, and it's still a blessing. It was still a blessing. And so yeah. I, I have to go that night. I go up to my, my kids rooms and I tell my youngest Xander and I, I tell all three of the boys, but um, when I got to Xander, I was like, hey, uh, buddy, I know we talked about snow skiing and all this, but uh, they haven't had snow in five years. So it's still going to be a fun trip. We're going to fly on a plane. We'll get to do it. And uh, man, the faith in this kid, he looked at me and he goes, no problem. I'll, I'll, I'll pray about it. And I was like, what? And so for two weeks, he prayed fervently for snow. Mm. The day before we left, we the Cloudcroft got so much snow that we couldn't actually make it to the cabin. I actually had to cash in uh, my uh, Hampton Inn, the, the yeah Hilton the points. They had a Hampton in there, and so we got there. And because of the snow, there was there was only one other family in that Hampton Inn. So for a whole week, and they had an indoor pool, and so we stayed at this Hampton Inn. We were able to get to the the ski lifts there. We snowed all week. We would come back to this, what seemed like a private hotel, hotel. <laughs> and we would get in the heated pool and we had such a great time. Well, Facebook today popped up and said, this is your memory from five years ago. Aww. And I did get to sit there and it was kind of a look back on things like, oh, God's got us. God's definitely got us. Have you ever got to, to thinking like, oh, maybe it was my fault. I've been traveling a lot. I've been focusing because, you know, do, being a comedian, being an artist on the road, really, a lot of times you are, you know, you have to put a lot of energy and focus on that. I mean, I'm not. Yeah, I've thought I've thought over and over. I've tried to get answers, um, you know. Yeah, I don't I don't know, because it, it was a pretty good system. I, I would only do I only did about 95 shows a year. Like I really tried to cap it so that I was home more than most husbands and fathers. Um, so I wouldn't take too many shows. Uh, I would try to do a lot of my shows in the summer when my family could travel with me. So I don't think that was ever an issue. Um, mm. You know, I don't know, maybe if I would have made more money, you know, <laughs> but I don't know. Uh, I, no, I, yeah. For, for, no. But for a long time, whenever I would get the kids to bed and I would, I couldn't sleep for months. I couldn't sleep. Uh, and I would, I would crawl in bed and I'd just be thinking, okay, what did I do? What, you know, what could I have done? What, you know? So yeah, you definitely have those doubts and, things like that creep up, but, um, yeah. I just, and when did you, when you met your wife now, how did the boys react to her? They were, they were very excited, um, at first because, uh, you know, they wanted me to be happy. In fact, they were, they were kind of encouraging me, especially my oldest son. My oldest son kind of knew what all was going on and he was a little more, uh, aware of everything. And so, you know, he, he, he was always telling me like, dad, you, you should date, you need to be happy, you deserve to be happy. Um, you know, it was weird because, you know, he was one of the first ones to tell me that I should date. And at the time I wasn't even thinking about it. Cause mm. you know, I mean, you know me, I was so faithful and I'm faithful in every relationship. Like when I hang out with my pastor, I don't look at other pastors. Um, so it was just, 
I don't. You're looking shocked. I don't. You know, I am shocked because I heard about you and pastors. No, like no, you're, no. You're always, going, there's always an associate pastor in mind when you're with the senior pastor talking to him and praying with him. There's always. No, I've never sat there <laughs> no. been like, oh, I wonder what his sermon's like. No, I'm focused on the pastor I'm with. Um, so <laughs> we, uh, yeah, so oh. they, they were excited and stuff. There was a big adjustment. So she has two kids. Mm which actually is kind of a cool story because when I first talked to her, I didn't know she, she mentioned that she had kids and I was like, how many kids do you have? And we had, our first phone call was a six hour phone call that we didn't plan, but we couldn't get off the phone with each other. And she was like, and she mentioned the kids toward the end, end uh, of the six hours. And I was like, how many kids do you have? And already I was kind of, I wasn't thinking that I was gonna marry her or anything like that, but I was thinking like, oh, she's cool. And she was like, I have two kids. And I, I can't believe I said this, but I was like, I don't know if I want more kids. And she said a beautiful, I know that's horrible, but she said two more kids is two more opportunities to love and to be loved. And I was like, oh, that's beautiful. Like this girl mm. has a heart for Jesus. And then she was like, how many kids do you have? And I said three and we got disconnected. Um, but, <laughs> but I was able to get her back on the phone. Um, so, th so they were very excited at first. Uh, Sarah's funny. Um, she's, she's definitely a boy mom. Um, she can throw the football like crazy, like all these things that, that she just kept surprising us of mm -hmm. how, you know, like perfect she was for the smiley boys. There, there is a big adjustment in blending families. She has two boys. Um, they've had completely different, uh, you know, lifestyles and, and how they grew up different from my boys. And, you know, my boys, very outdoors, uh, catching snakes. And, you know, uh, that's, that's a, we're, we're big into hunting and all this kind of stuff. Um, and so there was a, there was a little bit of like trying to blend the families and also figuring out like they, they loved her coming in, but then there's new rules and, uh, you know, we're changing stuff around the house and you can't like clean a deer in the living room, you know, some <laughs> rules like that. Uh, so there was some adjustments to it, but man, it's, it's so great. Like the kids really, really have welcomed her in. That's a good question. Cause that, that is a, one of the things that we address on the podcast, our podcast, Hook, Line and Smiley, a lot is the difficulty of blending a family together uh, because there's, there's just, it's, it's every single day. It's not like you fix it and then you move on. You may fix the one little situation, but ultimately it's constant. It's like a car. You're constantly tuning it and making sure you you know filling it with gas so it can you know get to the destination that you're headed to. That's a good analogy. Now, how are you and your family coping with the pandemic? Um, it's pretty good. My parents uh, order stuff for me to Uber Eats deliver, um, which helps make me money. <laughs> no, that's not true. Um, yeah, we're 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 dealing with it pretty well. Like I said, um, you know, God continues to bless us. We. So I was doing, I was doing our hook, line and smiley podcast for years. I've written for focus on the family for their junior high magazine called. Yes. Club I Club remember Club. that. Yeah. Well, so I created this character called average boy years ago. And I wrote a, an article for their magazine. It was like a humor article about um, it, the story was an actual true story of me going back to school and getting a really bad haircut in middle school. But when I wrote that first article, I thought of a cell phone joke that I thought was really funny and fit within that. Well, I realized that I couldn't, I couldn't make that story about me and have the cell phone joke in it because I didn't have cell phones went back then. So I just created a character and just called him Average Boy um, just for a generic thing. I thought it'd be one article and kids started writing in saying that they wanted more Average Boy stories. They actually were like, let this kid write more stories. So they even thought it was a kid. So I started mm -hmm. writing every single month that the character became big, uh, focus on the family. Let me write two comedy slash devotional books for middle school kids. And so those came out, those did really well. I tell you all that to say, like, it's crazy how something that happened way in the past, how God's like, Ooh, I can't wait for him to see how I'm going to use that later on. So in March, all my shows had canceled. And so I had no income coming in and Previously, like starting in the mid-December of 2018, Focus on the Family asked me if I would write and perform an Average Boy podcast just to see mm -hmm. if there was interest in families listening to 
a podcast of Average Boy that is short, like about 20 minutes long, that's funny, but also has some spiritual encouragement at the end. And I, you know, I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't see this, foresee this, you know, COVID thing. And so I was like, yeah, if I have time. And so I, I wrote some scripts, recorded them, put them out, and it did really well. So right when all my shows canceled, this Average Boy podcast that I just did for free, kind of on the side, it hit, it started hitting really big. It was getting a ton of downloads. And so they came back to me in March, kind of the beginning of April and was like, man, this is going great. Um, we'd like to actually pay you for doing this. And we're going to put out 52 podcasts for families to listen to with their kids. They greenlit me for a third Average Boy book, um, which I'm, I have four more chapters left to, to finish up. Wow. The book. That's what I've been writing on. But all of that came in which really helped float us. Um, and then all kidding aside, I've been Uber Eats driving. My wife teaches uh, at a private school. Um, all these little things just keep, she got tutoring jobs, you know, mm. um, just kind of out of the blue. It was getting, word was getting out of what a good teacher she was. And so parents started contacting her about tutoring. So it's just so great how I really feel like God was giving us, here's your manna, here's your manna for this month. You know, here's, mm. here's, to take care of these bills and stuff. So that's how we're getting through it is just looking up and being like, all right, just, you know, guide us around and give us the manna that you want us to have. And we'll be grateful and, you know, ready for whatever adventure you, you want to have for us. Amen. Now, what do you, as we're closing this podcast, how, how can you encourage people? What, what kind of encouragement do you have for people watching and listening? Well, that's a good question, Naz. Um, one, and, and this really dawned on me early on. So I feel like I've been able to take advantage of this, but we've always said, oh man, whenever, you know, if, if, if things slow down, I'm going to do this or if things, you know, if I wasn't so busy, I would, I would be able to do this. Well, all of a sudden, you know, at least in Texas, starting in March, everything went on hold. Mm -hmm. So we had time to invest in our kids. We had time to invest in our marriage. We had time to, you know, again, I'm, I'm really big into hunting and it provides for my family. And, um, so like my wife and I redid my deer stand, uh, for this season, I shouldn't have let her like dictate everything. I think the wind chimes were a really bad idea. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's way too noisy, but, but I think we got to, we got to do all these projects that we kept saying like, Oh, all of a sudden I'm home every weekend. And so mm -hmm. we have time to invest more in our, our church group, you know, our, our Sunday school classes and, and, you know, the, the couples around our neighborhood that we were like, man, I wish we could, you know, get to know them a little better. And so that's one of the encouragements. The world's kind of on hold. I know it's kind of starting back up and all that, but like, we've had a big chunk of time where we can actually like realize what is important. It goes back to my financial thing. What do you really need? Like what is really important in your life? That's what you need to invest your time in. And while a lot of this is on hold and people aren't out traveling and, and shopping and doing all that kind of stuff. My wife is, she hadn't quit shopping at all. Um, but we'll get to prayer requests later. Um, <laughs> but um, I think we need to invest in, e in each other. We're built for community and now's a great time to invest. And a lot of people, you know, I've got friends that I haven't heard from in a long time and they'll, now they can text me because they have something to say, you know, like, Hey, how are you doing during the you know quarantine? Or, Hey, will you be on my Facebook live tomorrow night? Um, you know, like they're, they're coming up with things, you know, to interact. And I think we need to do that. I think we need to reach out and uh, just invest in each other's lives more. Cause again, we are built for community. The other encouragement I would give, and I can say this having gone through, you know, a terrible divorce and uh, broken marriage and all this kind of stuff I learned, I learned this lesson then nothing surprises God at all. Mm. So when I was sitting at night going, what is going on? You know, how can this be, you know, happen? You know, it destroyed two families in our church. Like how, like I had a lot of like, how could you let this happen? How could you, well, one, he doesn't make it happen. Like people make bad choices. Right. And then, it manifests itself into bad situations that sometimes people, sometimes bad decisions that other people make around you affects you. And so I think it's important to remember that nothing that happens surprises God though. 
and that he's in control. And when you can realize that, like no matter what, as long as we're trying to make good decisions and we're trying to keep our eyes focused on Christ, he is going to truly be that light that guides us through the darkest times in life. And so if we realize that none of this is surprising, then I think it'll kind of calm us down and maybe give us a little bit of confidence to, you know, get up and go and continue to do what we need to do to get through all this. That's that's a great question. Now, uh, you know, you're you have products. You still, I mean, just because we're not performing, we still have products to sell. What do you? Uh, what do you? What kind of T-shirts do you have? That's your. Oh, I didn't realize. Says, I, I didn't realize <laughs> I did this, but I do have the uh, expressions of COVID uh, T-shirt that is available, and uh-huh. um, I've got. I, I am a big advocate of reading the bible uh my grandmother actually taught me that when i was young she was like read the bible when you're young it makes me mad that young kids never read the bible and elderly people are reading it like crazy because it's like they're trying to cram for a final so Uh i've always read the bible and it bothers me that people don't they misquote jesus all the time you know i had a neighbor come up one time and he was like yeah it's like jesus said with great power comes great responsibility. What? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you're laughing. That means you're cramming for your final. Um, I didn't even let him off the hook. I was like, is that in first or second Spider-Man? But so one of my shirts is in the back here. Uh, One of my shirts just has a, uh, you know, drawing of Jesus. And it just says, I never said that because (laughs) he gets misquoted all the time. And And here's the truth of it. How can we live out what Jesus said if we don't know what he said? So mm. I, 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 the shirt's funny. I like that, but I, I, it makes a better message and it's, it's a great conversation starter. I also have a, a shirt that actually is good for you, Naz. Uh, it says, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not as random as you think I'd squirrel. So those, uh, those are available there um, at bobsmiley.com. And because it is like, I know it's after Christmas, but I'm going to offer something to your, your listeners, your viewers, sure. um, Right now, if they'll go to bobsmiley.com, click on the store, um, each listener or viewer can purchase one item or more. <gasps> Are you serious? How long is this offer going to be? Uh, until the rapture. Oh, okay. That's so hurry up, people. If you yeah. heard here, let me repeat the offer just to affirm it's true. If you go to bobsmiley.com right now and to go to his store, you can buy one item or more. Yeah. And he will let you do that. Yeah. And just like after my dry bar comedy special, I'm going to sit back and wait for the, the phone. Yeah, and I'm the ordering to right start now. <laughs> well, Bob, thank you so, so much. And if people who are watching or listening, and I know some people listen a year from now or something, Bob is a very funny man. He can bring the comedy in a very professional way. Plus, the, you know, he brings Jesus to it too. So uh, also, if you want to check focus on the family and check average man that's uh yeah, average, average boy. boy yeah average boy that's yeah. bob smiley so bob thank you so much for taking the time yeah. naz it is like I, I really did look at all the comics that you had on and i was like why hadn't he had me on and then i realized like oh you're having me on your 200th special like your 200th that's episode speaking and that means of that so much to me what are you doing on new year's eve i'm kissing my wife what okay <laughs> What about, okay, we're doing, we're doing our New Year's Eve and this is live and I'm taking the chance. New Year's Eve, we're doing the live with Naz, which we do every weeknight at 8.30 p.m. Pacific time. What are we going to do on New Year's Eve? We're going to stay from 8.30 until midnight Pacific time. So we make sure everybody celebrates their Christmas in different time zones. Uh, If you can, would you love to virtually Zoom and do some comedy for our some of them are your fans. I would love that. Let me just check with my wife. Say I'm busy. Hey, uh, what are we doing New Year's? Can I do Naz's show? Busy. No, louder. You're busy. A little bit louder. You're really busy. I'm really busy, Naz. Okay, it's okay. All right. Well, that's a thousand dollars I'm saving. <laughs> Such a dejected puppy. <laughs> what? You look like a dejected puppy. <laughs> I do. Is that your wife really in the background? Yeah. Hey, baby, say something else so they know you're real. No, she's not real. Don't say you're pretend, but she's she really is here. I really did. I really did get away. Um, no, I will try. We're going to be out at her parents' farm. Oh, okay. 
So it's if the, that's, uh, the Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi is, is a little, iffy. little iffy, but if I can, can I just text you and like yes. before to get all the if information you, and stuff? Yes. No okay. problem. Thank you so much for your time. Love you, man. And thank you for what you do. Hopefully we get to work together. I know we will. We'll get to work together again in the near future. Thank yeah. you so much and happy new year, Bob. You too, man. Love you, Nas. Love you too. And for you guys watching, you know what? If you are watching this live on the 31st, which is in two days, we're going to do a live with Nas episode number 200. And we're going to go from 8.30 p.m. Pacific time till midnight. So going to have a bunch of comedians and other stuff, other surprises. So join us on this page, Comedian Nazareth on Facebook. Love you guys. Thank you so much. And uh, have a great this day. Is, this is the awkward part. How do I leave here? You can't. I don't want That's it to be awkward. Problem. No, as long as but... people are buying from BobSmiley.com, they cannot leave. <laughs> You're the best. I'll see you, bud. Bye. Thanks, bud. Take care.